Hello, my name is Hunter. My name is Ashley. And I just want to say, have a great, great toy service. The Father has a plan, though it's hard to see it now. You feel you're walking all alone, but he is there, no doubt. When the storm around you rages, and you're tossed to and fro, when you're faced with life's decisions, not sure which way to go, stand still and let God move. Standing still is hard to do. When you feel you have reached the end, he'll make a way for you. Stand still and let God move. When the enemy surrounds you and the walls are closing in, when the tide is swiftly rising and you wonder where he's been, Friend, there never was a moment that his arms weren't reaching out. You can rest assured and be secure. God is moving right now. Stand still and let God move. Standing still is hard to do. When you feel you have reached the end, he'll make a way for you. Stand still and let God move. The answer will come, but only in his time. Stand still and let God move. Stand still and let God move. If you have your Bibles, let's go to the book of Revelation tonight. And we'll be in chapter number one. And we'll begin reading in verse number nine. And the Bible says in Revelation chapter number one, beginning in verse nine, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one, like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paths with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet likened to fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this privilege and honor to be able to preach your word today. Lord, I pray, God, that you touch it, bless the message, and bless those that hear it. Help us in all that we do, and help us to do your will. For it's in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Tonight, I want to preach on this thought, seeing Jesus. Uh, dear friend, I want to preach on seeing Jesus. Now, as you read this passage, there's no doubt that that's exactly who John is seeing here. Uh, he's not seeing an angel, and he's not getting this message from anyone else, but he is seeing Jesus Christ uh, in the flesh and in this vision. Uh, but I want you to notice, first of all, where John sees Jesus at. Uh, in verse number 9, John says that he is in the Isle of Patmos. 
Uh, now, if you know anything about the Isle of Patmos, it was a prison place. Uh, it was a place that the Romans would send their prisoners. I did a little research on it, and it says that I was off the coast of Turkey, and it was about uh, 6 by 30 miles. It was a very narrow and long strip of land. Uh, it was a harsh place. It was a place of, of harsh conditions. It was rocky, and, and they would send prisoners there that they were afraid would, dis would escape and would find a way out. Uh, but in this place, uh, in this place of isolation, in this place of separation, and in this place of tribulation, John sees Jesus. And what I want you to understand, dear friend, is even in these places, in this place that John did not choose to be, I imagine if we were to talk to John before he saw Jesus, that the Isle of Patmos would not have been on his places of, of wanting to be. Uh, this was not a place of John's choosing, yet it is here that John finds Jesus. Uh, and I want you to understand that even in the harshest of conditions and even in the places of isolation and separation, even in places of imprisonment, we can find Jesus tonight, dear friend. Uh, this is where John found him at. Uh, it wasn't in the church and it wasn't in a place of peace. It wasn't in a place of, of happiness, but it was rather in a place of tribulation and trial that John turned around and found Jesus. But I want you to notice not only where John saw Jesus, but when John saw Jesus. If you look with me in verse number 10, John says, I was in the Spirit, notice this, on the Lord's day. I got to thinking about this. Now, we know that John is probably referencing the Sabbath here, and, and of course that's a holy day. Uh, but I began to think about how John phrased this. He said it was the Lord's day. I began to think about how that every day is the Lord's day. In Psalm 118, verse 24, we find it, the Bible says, This is the day the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Can I say to you, dear friend, that every day is the Lord's day. And what I'm trying to get across here is that every day we can see Jesus. We don't have to wait just for a Sunday or for a Wednesday night. We don't have to wait for all the conditions to be perfect. But any day can be a day when we can find Christ. Uh, the day of salvation in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 2 says that today is the day of salvation. Uh, the day of visitation, if you remember when uh, Zacchaeus uh, ran into Jesus, Jesus said that today I must abide at thy house. Uh, the day uh, of preservation when the, the thief on the cross turned and Jesus said to him that today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Uh, that the, the Lord deals with today and he deals in this day and he says that this is the Lord's day. And John says that's exactly when he found Jesus. What I'm trying to say, dear friend, is we don't have to have the perfect conditions and the perfect set of, of things to line up to find Christ that he can find us at any time because every day is his day. Not only do we notice where John saw Jesus and not only do we notice when John saw Jesus, but I want you to notice something else here. I want you to understand why John saw Jesus. Notice again with me in verse number 10. John, he says, uh, I was in the Spirit. I began to think about this. Uh, Jesus said in, John, in, in uh, John chapter 4, verse 24, he told the woman at the well that God is a spirit, and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And John says, I was in the Spirit. Uh, in other words, there is an internal thing that happens. There is a requirement of us if we're going to see Christ. John had done some things to get ready. He says that I was in the Spirit. Uh, and can I say to you, dear friend, that we have to do some things to be prepared to meet Jesus at any point in time. Uh, he can show up anywhere in any way, uh, but we've got to do our part to be ready. Uh, we need to be clean and in fellowship. And in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, we find that if we're not, that all we have to do is confess our sins and that Jesus is faithful and just forgive us, but not just forgive us, but to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus himself will not only uh, forgive us, but he does the cleansing to make us ready to meet him. Uh, we need to have a place of sacrifice in our life. Uh, if you remember, uh, there is a... a a passage in the Bible in Matthew chapter 17 and the disciples were unable to perform an act and they asked the Lord how come they could not do these things and Jesus answered them this way he said 
Uh, how be it this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting? I believe if we're going to be in the spirit today, we're going to have to do some, some things. We're going to have to sacrifice some things. We're going to have to get into a, a sacrificial prayer and put ourselves in a place of subservience and, and obedience and humility to Christ as we seek his will and seek his way in our life. Uh, we're going to have to do some fasting. We're going to have to give up some things and remove some things from our life as we seek his will. John says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Uh, to get into the spirit, we're going to have to do some some things. We're going to have to be clean. We're going to have to sacrifice. But can I say to you, we're also going to have to have some dedication. Uh, we find in Daniel chapter number one, verse eight, Daniel said this. He said, the Bible says this about Daniel. He said, but Daniel uh, purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Daniel had made a choice in his life that he was not going to defile himself with those things of the world, with the things of the sin, uh, the things that would bring him to a place where he could not worship and be in a place of service. And can I say to you, dear friend, if we're going to find Jesus today, if we're going to see him today, we're going to have to have some things in our life of dedication. We're going to have to purpose in our heart that we are going to serve him. Amen. But then I would also tell you this internal thing requires a dedication, but it requires a, a, the way in which we walk. And we find throughout the, the New Testament that we are to walk circumspectly and we're to walk worthy. Uh, in 1 John, we find that we're to walk as Jesus walked. We're to follow his great example. If we're ever going to get in the spirit, we're going to have to put ourselves aside and we're going to have to walk in the way that is pleasing to Christ. That's the internal part. But I want you to notice there's another piece to this of why John saw Jesus. Look with me in verse number 12. The Bible says, and I turn to see. Can I say to you that it's not enough just to hear his voice, that we've got to do our part and turn around and find him. John said, I heard a voice, but I didn't just hear the voice. I turned to see who was talking to me. And if we're ever going to see Christ, there's going to be something that's required of us. Jesus could have showed up in front of John. Jesus could have made it easy for John. John's in a hard place, and you would think that, that this is uh, Jesus' dear friend. This is the one that laid his head upon his, his breast, the one that communed with him, the one that walked with him, the one that talked with him. You would think that Jesus would be concerned about John's well-being. Why doesn't he show up right in front of him and make it easy? And yet, in this hard place, in this prison place, he shows up behind John. Why? Because he wants to see if John really is looking for him. And when Jesus spoke, John turned around. John said, I turned around. And can I say to you, dear friend, not only do we have to be prepared to meet him, we have to be listening and we have to be ready to do what he is re requesting of us. There is an external piece of that. John responded. And if we're going to see Christ today, dear friend, we are going to have to respond when he shows up in our life. But then I would point this out to you, and there's not only the, the why and the the, the where and all those other things, but I, I would want you to see this. I want you to see the way in which John saw Jesus. Look with me in, again in verse 13. It, the Bible says, In the midst of the, uh, the seven ca uh, candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. And he'll go on to describe this vision. Can I say to you that John has seen Jesus as his friend? He's seen him as master when he forsook all. He saw him as a compassionate healer as he went around touching those that were in need. He saw him as the lamb that was silent before the accusers as he became that sacrifice. He saw him as the risen Savior at the tomb. He saw him as the ascending Savior that would soon come. But here in this place, John is seeing Jesus for who he truly is, and that is the living Son of God. There is no mistake. Jesus has taken the veil off. There is no other way in which John is seeing him. And can I say to you, dear friend, when you get a true vision of Jesus as he truly is, when you see him as God... And and I understand that he is that friend that sticketh closer than a brother. I understand that he'll go with us through the ends of the earth. I understand that we can bring our problems to him and we can cast our cares upon him. But make no mistake about it, he is still God. And we've got to get to a place where we see him as God. And that's exactly how John is seeing Jesus here. 
Uh, you can hear it in his words. He's saying uh, that he's like unto the Son of God. And his hair is like white uh, wool. And his eyes are like a flame of fire. Uh, and John's really saying here is, I don't really have the words to describe what I'm seeing. And if you ever get a true vision of Christ, dear friend, you won't have the words. Because words will fail to really com to compass who and what Jesus is. John is seeing him as God. Uh, you can see it in his response in verse number 17. The Bible says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Can I say to you that when you come into the presence of the living God, there is only one response. Isaiah had it as he cried, I'm a man of unclean lips. Uh, we find it over and over throughout the Bible that any that ever came in contact with God in his true form could not stand in his presence. Presence. But John says, I fell as, a, as one dead. Uh, that's his, uh, that outward response. Uh, and, and I got to thinking about this, how that the Bible says that, uh, that every eye is going to see Jesus and that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And there's going to be one response that every man, woman, boy, and girl in this world has, and it's going to be just like John has here. We're all going to be in reverential silence as we behold the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundation of our world. Uh, dear friend, I want you to notice, though, not only how John saw Jesus, I want you to notice Jesus' response to John. And verse number 17 also, he says, And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not. And then he goes on to tell who he is. Uh, Jesus' response to John is not one of, of making him to be obedient, though he has every right to have that uh, obligation from John. But rather, he puts his hand upon him, and he gives him encouragement, and tells him he does not have to be afraid. And I'm glad to know that as a child of God, that we do not have to fear. We do not have to uh, fear being in his presence, that it is an honor to be in his presence. He welcomes us into his presence. And while we need to be reverential, and while we will have that same response, uh, dear friend, we have to understand that, that Jesus uh, welcomes us and uh, will encourage us with these words, be not afraid. The, the, excuse me, again, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. And I'm glad to know in the presence of Christ that the child of God does not have to have fear, but he can have confidence in and peace in knowing who his Savior is. I want you to notice, though, in closing here, the impact that this had on John. Now, I mentioned earlier that John is in a prison place. He's in a place of persecution. He's in a place of isolation. He's in a place of separation. But notice with me uh, the impact that John, that this has on John. Uh, begin in verse number four. John begins to write to the seven churches, and he says, Grace be unto you, and peace from him which is. And it will go on and say in, in verse 5, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. And then he'll go on in verse 6 to say, And hath made us kings and priests. And I would remind you, dear friend, that John is writing this in a prison place. And yet after seeing Christ as he truly is, after seeing him as God, John has a, a invigoration and encouragement. He wants to share the message of Christ. I'd also remind you that this is written at the latter part of John's life. We believe John to be in his 90s when he's writing this. And God is using a 90-year-old man in prison to, to send forth the gospel, to send forth the message of encouragement to those that need it most. And aren't you glad that we can have that, in, that impact on us when Christ really shows up in our life, when he really takes that hold of us, that he can use anybody at any time in any circumstance. And I just wanted to point out today that we don't have to wait till we get to the other side to see. John is on earth when he sees Christ. He's in a prison place when he sees Christ. He's in a hard place when he sees Christ. And so too can we. And tonight I just hope this has been a help to you. I hope it's been a blessing. And I hope that we'll uh, look and see him in everywhere we go. Father, we thank you for this privilege, this honor. I pray, God, that you bless the message, touch those that hear it. Help us in all that we do. We'll give you all the honor and praise and glory. In Jesus' precious name.
some scripture for y'all at New Life this evening. And uh, so I have a scripture in Psalms 34 that the Lord laid on my heart. The, uh, just kind of give you a little background. I only, only, I only got one, one verse that's really been on my heart. But uh, kind of give you a background of Psalm 34. It was written after David had changed his behavior. And so actually he had been uh, on the run from Saul. Saul was after him, you know, killed, was trying to kill him. And he found himself in a place called Ambalek. And uh, when he was there, a, a man named Achaz caught up with him. And so David was in fear for his life again. And he really was trying to figure out how to get out of it. So he changed his behavior and began to act like a madman. And I, at the end of the thing, basically they let him go. They were like, well, he's crazy. I'm gonna let him go. But I thought about that. David acted in a way that he was acting like a man that he knew he was not called of God to act like. And I thought, how familiar is that with us? How many times in our life do we do things that God is, we know that we are not supposed to be doing, but we've changed our behavior because of our circumstances or because of peer pressure or whatever it is that's going on in our life. And But I'm thankful that God in his infinite mercy still shows that grace and his mercy. But he showed us in Psalm 34, I'll read this one verse, and he says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. That word taste means to take notice of, and that word see says to take comfort in. And as I was studying this, I thought about a man that's named Rodney Hall that I used to work with, and we're friends on Facebook, and he's every time I pull it up, he puts pictures of what he's grilling. And man, it always looks so good, and I'm like, man, that looks good, you know? But you know what? I've never tasted of anything he's cooked. But I can sit here tonight and tell you that I've tasted of the Lord, and he is good. And he says, not only taste him, he says, but see or take comfort in him. He said, so tonight, if we're struggling with something and things are going on in our life, we need to go to him. And But the only way we can do that is if we know him. But he says, taste and see that the Lord is good. I promise you, if you've ever tasted him, you'll see that he is good. I love you, new life, and I thank you for this time.